Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here with us on this holiday weekend. Of course, uh, don't tell anybody that isn't normally that 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 is normally here, but isn't today. But you know who the faithful are. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, but it is. A, we've been having glorious days, haven't we? Weather-wise, I mean, it's beautiful outside. Special welcome to those who are visiting with us today. You'll find in the pew pocket in front of you a welcome card. Please take that, fill it out, and put it in the offering plate to be collected shortly. We're welcoming back Schaefer Parker, who will be speaking with us again in uh, the book of Second Peter. And he'll be continuing that study over the next few weeks. And of course, we've already had the special delight of having this uh, music team. Uh, there's somebody from five continents. And, well, they're all living in the fifth. <laughs> but they're from four different, uh, originally from four different continents on this planet. And they're here. None of them, I, I, well, I don't, know, I don't know Grace well enough to know that English is not your first language, is it? No. So they're all here with English as second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever language. And uh, I, marvelous job, ladies. Looking forward to you continuing to lead us in worship this morning. There is a box in the foyer. It's on the floor. It's sort of in that corner. And it's got a sign on it that says something for Hope Mission. School supplies. Today, next week, that's it for the opportunity to fill that box with school supplies. If you're wondering, well, what school supplies should you get? Look at the church newsletter that came out earlier this week or last week. And the list is there. And the list will probably still be in next week's newsletter. Let's fill that box and we'll take it to Hope Mission the following week, okay? But that's it. They need it by the 16th, which is a Friday. So after next Sunday, I'll make my way up to Hope Mission and deposit it. A, sp 
a, a different kind of announcement. Some of you may use the online giving service Tithely. Uh, pretty soon that's going to go inactive for a little while. And so if you are used to using Tithely, please refrain from using it for the next short while until you hear otherwise. And related to that, we need our church trustees. Hopefully you remember who you are. <laughs> that would be Richard Bias and Diane and Chris Wang, Christopher Wang. If you could meet just very briefly after the service, it's not going to be a long meeting. Yes, it has to do with Tithely. <laughs> so, just a short note about that. Lastly, on the announcement list, Vacation Bible School. Did you guys see the banner out front? Did you see the posters inside? Well, I'm saying, yeah, no, yes, no. Well, you hopefully you will. And uh, it's the weekend of Friday, August 23rd, Saturday 24, and Sunday 25. And uh, listen, we've got helpers that we need for the Sunday afternoon barbecue and carnival. I believe there are some, uh, there's a link in the newsletter that you can fill out either call or email Brenda Bateman or C. Rowena Bias today. Let them know in what way and or if any way you can help on that Sunday for the barbecue. That's all of the announcements I have today. If we can have the ushers come and uh, collect the offering as I pray and I'll read just one verse out of the book of Micah. Micah is talking to all those who have the feeling that if I put something in the plate or if I come and give an offering, that ought to be good. That's what God wants, right? Well, it's not exactly what the Lord says. He said this, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy? and to walk humbly with your God. He wants people, not stuff. Let's give him in our lives justice, showing mercy, walking with humility before the Lord whom we adore. Let's pray and dedicate our time and our gifts to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, the opportunity to come and sing praises to your name, to look into your word, to have the Holy Spirit move in us and touch areas of our life that we need to grow in. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all the provision you have given us, all the opportunities you've given us to serve you, to live lives pleasing to you. Now, Father, as we continue in this worship service, may it continue to glorify you, your name. May we in our hearts continue to give you praise, to put you first in our lives, to ascribe that worth that is due no other. Father, I pray that whatever gifts and offerings we present today, that you would bless both gift and giver. May we give as good stewards, not as those who were granting some sort of special offering out of the generosity of our heart. No, Lord, may we 
may we give to you because we love you, because we know you own all things that we may claim as ours, that we are merely moving some of your assets out of one pocket and into another for ministry. And I pray that those funds be used for your honor, for your glory in ways that are pleasing to you. These things we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please be seated. Let's take some time and come before the Lord, bringing our prayer requests and our praise notes to him. Heavenly Father, as the deer panteth for water, may we have the same kind of thirst for you. May we live our lives in such a way that declares that you are our God. May we manifest your splendor in ways that glorify you, not ourselves. <laughs> Father, has been our habit, we continue to pray for our transition team for the discernment and wisdom in the days ahead as they conduct the search for a new pastor. Lord, in that same light, we also pray for the one you are preparing to be our pastor, asking that you would keep us unified as a family of believers, growing together and being transformed into the image of your son. Lord, we pray for Anthony and Rachel, who are now in Moldova. 
We pray for their ministry with Teach Beyond and ask for their safety, for their clarity and boldness as they proclaim the gospel, the good news about your son, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we pray for the children and families who will attend VBS later this month. We pray for the team of workers who will be preparing and helping to put VBS on. We pray for your grace to use us in ways to convey the truth, your truth, found in your word. May we do so with clarity and boldness to our families, to our friends, to our neighbors, and whoever comes to hear and learn about you. Father, there are many with medical concerns or who are recovering or who are experiencing loss this morning. You are the great physician. You are the great comforter. You are the great healer, both in terms of the body and of the soul. We pray that in whatever way we might assist to provide comfort or help to those who are struggling at this time, we pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, move among your people and enable us to meet those needs. We pray also for those who are traveling and vacationing and destinations that are away with us. Protect them. Bring them back safely, but rested and well-nourished. Heavenly Father, in particular, I pray for Wayne. I pray for Iemi and Dupe, for Tope and Ibukun. I pray for Salvin and Rajitha, or Pinky. Lord, I pray for Jeremy. And I ask that you would protect them physically, spiritually, emotionally, and intellectually. Draw them closer to you. Help them put their love for you first. Transform them into the image of your son day by day, no matter the circumstances of life. Father, we are thankful for Schaefer and for his willingness to come and minister to us through your word. And I pray that your spirit would be our teacher this morning, helping us to both understand and apply your word to our lives. These things we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. to be on. Ah, and I can even tell the difference myself. I fiddled with it a while ago and got confused about which way it's, it's behind my back there so I couldn't see, so I was just concerned. Okay, very good. Anyway, you get tired of hearing me say how much uh, Jeannie and I appreciate the privilege of worshiping with you Sunday by Sunday, the privilege that I have of opening God's word to you Sunday by Sunday this, uh, through this summer. Thank you again for the welcoming spirit we feel every Sunday when we're here. I, uh, I'm going to chase a rabbit just for a second. Paul mentioned the fact that on a day like today, you could sort of tell holiday weekend and so forth. You can tell who the faithful are. Let me go you one better, just a, a little story out of my past. Uh, my wife's from Tennessee, and I went to college in Tennessee. That's why we met and where we met. But um, uh, one of the things about Tennessee is that it is warmer overall than, say, Canada is. But it, it does have times when you can get some snow. 
Uh, you can even get six inches on the odd time. Two or three inches is much more common. But the thing you have to remember about East Tennessee, where, where I served in my first uh, uh, couple of pastorates, and, or associate pastorate kind of things, and Jeannie was with me and so forth. But you're in the corner of, you're right on the edge of the Appalachian Mountains, and it is some hilly country. And, and the hills are, while not as large as, say, our foothills here in Alberta, uh, they're steeper and they're closer together, so the valleys are narrower, and, and, and uh, the, all the, the roads and streets are just, can be very, very intimidating, even when they're dry, let alone when they've got two or three inches of snow on. And remember, this was back in the 1970s, no front-wheel drive cars, no four-wheel drive cars, a few Jeeps, but other than that, no four-wheel drive cars, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, none of the kind of all-weather radials that we have today. So a car was a much more dangerous and difficult uh, thing to maneuver when there were a few inches of snow on, on the road. And so I saw from time to time, we'd have a, you know, a stretch of bad weather on a Friday and Saturday, there'd be a couple of inches of snow on, on the road, and the congregation could be reduced to as little as a third of its ordinary size. So a considerably smaller group than we're having here today compared to the standard size, whatever it happened to be. But here's what I noticed. You were saying we find the faithful here. Let me tell you about the faithful. The faithful love to sing. And one of the things I noticed, because in those days I was responsible for leading the worship, the music side of the worship, and one of the things I noticed was that even though the place was hollowed out, all you had to do was look and you saw that, you know, there's hardly anybody here compared to last sun Sunday or the last six or eight Sundays, hardly anybody here, but the volume never changed. The, the, the hymn singing was as loud as it had been the previous week or any other time. So the people that love to sing love to come to church to sing. And they'll even brave the snow, they'll brave the ice, they'll brave whatever they have to brave to get together. And uh, so if, the, um, if communism ever takes over Canada and we're not allowed to worship publicly, I can tell you the problem is going to be that even though our congregations will be shrunk down and maybe in hiding, we'll have to sort of help one another to not sing so loud lest we be discovered. Anyway, enough of that. If you've got a Bible, turn to first, or Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 1. This will be the last message, God willing, from chapter 1. Now, you'll remember I've, I'm privileged to be with you a total of six weeks. And I mentioned earlier I, I was going to preach three sermons from chapter 1, one sermon from chapter 2, and then two sermons from chapter 3. Uh, actually, as I've talked to other people a little bit about, you know, you, what are you preaching from, and you tell them, and, and other pastors, and it's interesting that a lot of people have said to me, that they think 2 Peter may be uh, maybe the least preached book in the Bible, uh, in the New Testament for sure, uh, maybe with the exception of 2 and 3 John. Those are the two that wouldn't be uh, preached from that often either. But 2 Peter is rarely preached from, partly because of some of the things you're going to find in chapter 2, and it's for that reason that I'm going to only preach one message from chapter 2, because there are controversial and difficult matters there, and uh, I would rather... Let me tell you, my, maybe I've said this before, but my life goal, and I've prayed about this and I've declared it to a number of people, and both in public and in private, and that is my goal is that every time you leave this congregation, if I've been the one who preached, you'll leave loving Jesus more and loving God's word and believing more strongly in God's word than you ever did before. I want to leave you with reasons to believe in and a purpose in believing rather than raising doubts and difficulties just for the sake of raising doubts and difficulties. They're there. I'm not going to run away from them. Even today, I'm not going to run away from them. But at the same time, we don't need to emphasize that side of things. Pray for me as I prepare for next Sunday and actually the last three sermons that I'll be able to preach with you in this, in this series um, because there are controversial matters. And I, again, one of the things that I've said in prayer to God over and over is, Lord, don't let the fear of man ever stop me from anything that you want me to say in the pulpit. All right, we're in 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, and we're going to start in verse 12. So let me ask you to stand as we read God's word together, please. In honor of God's word, we're going to stand. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Peter says, Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them. This is what he's been talking about, these character qualities that are ours by virtue of God's grace and his mighty power working in our lives. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. But he says, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. 
In other words, he's about to die. Very soon will die. And then verse 15, And I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice from God or from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And so now you know we're talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is God's Word, and may He bless its reading. Thank you, and be seated, please. And as you're being seated, let's just bow our heads for a brief word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again I pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer, O God, by the Holy Spirit, may we understand the truth of your word, may we love it, and may we find ourselves able to apply it to our lives in a way that makes everyone see Jesus more and more clearly through everything we think, say, and do. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so I've titled the message this, this, uh, today, God's Greatest, or not God's, that was last week, God's Greatest Promises, sorry. Today is about the God's Greatest Memory Aid. I, and we're going to get to that in just a second. But I do, I do want to remind you that in last Sunday's text, Peter revealed the greatest promises that God has ever granted to human beings. And I hope you remember what Peter said last week. I'll remind you of the three major statements that he makes in last week's text. text. Number one, God's divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's in verse 3. Secondly, he tells us that God's promises enable us to become partakers of the divine nature. Imagine that. We, as mere human beings, partakers of the divine nature, verse 4. That's in verse 4. And then, with God's help, we can develop a divine level of faith and virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, and, and likely many other gifts and fruits of the Spirit. We can develop all these things with God's help because of the promises He's made, because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and that's all in verses 5 through 7. Now, in today's text, Peter reveals that he is getting ready to die. Thus, nothing is more important than reminding his readers to always remember what God has made available to them. He's already given us the information in verses 3 through 7. And then he says, I want to remind you of these things. I want you to keep them in mind. Nothing is more important than you remember what God has made available to you. He wants to ensure that no matter how rough life gets, and remember he wrote this in the last decade, probably less than than six years before the destruction of Jerusalem and uh, before the awful tribulation period that they went through in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the years right around it. And so he wants to ensure that no matter how rough life gets, soldiers of the cross never forget what is possible for a life lived in Christ. Thus, this section of that chapter, 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1, this section of the epistle is all about remembering. Let me show you again. We'll highlight the verses. In uh, verse 12, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Verse 13, I think it right as long as I am in this body to stir you up by way of reminder. And then finally, verse 15, I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. So let me ask you a question. How does a dying man make it possible for people to remember something after he's gone? Here's the answer. He writes it down. 
he wants you to remember. So he writes it down. And as he's writing this first chapter that we've read so far, as he's writing, he remembers that he is part of a long tradition stretching all the way back to Moses. Godly men writing stuff down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, eventually being collated by the work of God's Holy Spirit again, collated into a book called the Bible. Thus, this Bible is full of an account of all that Peter and God wants us to remember. Let's just get that in our heads here. This is the book that includes everything that God wants us to remember. You can't exaggerate how important and how powerful that thought is if we use it rightly. So notice then how strongly Peter affirms that the Bible is God's book. Still looking at our text from this morning. In verse 16, he says that the apostolic message about Jesus is no myth. Let's just nail that down. It's not a made-up story. In, uh, in uh, verse 16, again, the message of the Bible is all about our Lord Jesus Christ, his first coming, and, of course, his second coming. Thirdly, Peter can attest to that because of, uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he, along with James and John, were eyewitnesses of Jesus' divine, heavenly, kingly majesty. Again in verse 16, they saw him revealed as King of kings and Lord of lords. They heard, in verse 17, the Father say, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now, here I, I, I feel forced to bring another passage of, of Scripture to bear here. I'm thinking about Matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 5, where Matthew tells us the story of the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where we learn that Peter was not alone, that the other apostles, two other apostles were with him, James and John. And Jesus, of course, was there. And then they, they of course, we read there about Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus about his upcoming death and resurrection and so forth. But there, Matthew adds one significant statement to what we read in 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter says he heard, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. He also adds in Matthew that the father said, hear him. This is crucial. He, he, the father says, he's my beloved son. In him I am well pleased, or with him I am well pleased. And then he adds, hear him. That was also said on the Mount of Transfiguration. In other words, God was saying, and I hope that we all believe this already, you need to listen to Jesus the same way you listen to me. Now that may sound like old news to people like us. We grew up in a Christian environment more than likely. And when, when you were born again, you were born again into a Christian environment. The Bible has been around for 2,000 years with the New Testament. You probably read much of the New Testament already. And so you have no problem. In fact, our problem may be the exact opposite today because so many of us have read the New Testament in what's called a red letter version of the Bible where the words of Jesus are highlighted with red print. And, uh, and the problem I have there is that we sometimes get so excited about the red print that we forget that it's all the Word of God. The black print is just as much the Word of God as the red print. Sure, these are things Jesus actually said, but how do we know he said them? He said them because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and a couple of things in the book of Acts, he said them because they are recorded for us by some of the apostolic writers. And, and it's because of them that we know what, but again... Was Paul less inspired when he wrote the book of Romans than Matthew was when he wrote Matthew? No, not at all. Equally inspired by the Holy Spirit, all of it's the Word of God. All of it's the Word of God. I cannot overemphasize that. But in the first century, in the middle of Jesus' ministry, it was a, a lesson that even the disciples needed to learn, and that is that when Jesus speaks, God is speaking. When Jesus speaks, his words are as divine as anything you would find in the book of Isaiah or in the Psalms or any other book in the Old Testament. So Jesus, uh, the, 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 Matthew, Mark, uh, not Matthew, sorry, Peter, James, and John heard the heavenly voice, God the Father speaking, this is my son, hear him. In addition, they learned from Jesus that the Old Testament is the word of God. And that's partly in verse 19, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The Old Testament is the word of God, but I'm going to say more about that in a moment, so let's move quickly on. Peter also declares that there is a lifetime benefit in paying attention to God's word because it 
alone is the lamp that lights our way to heaven while we stumble through the darkness of this world. Again, look at verse 19. You will do well to pay attention to a, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And so the Bible is our guide through this life and into the life to come. And then Peter says, as he finishes up in chapter 1, you can trust the Bible, and by that he means the Old Testament, you can trust the Old Testament because its prophecies are not merely the opinions of men, but rather the product of the work of God's Holy Spirit. Do you see that? Verse 21, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So whether we're talking about Moses, whether we're talking about the author or authors of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, uh, whether we're talking about David in the Psalms and the other psalmists, whether we're talking about the prophets, both major and minor, they were speaking as God bore them along by the work of God's Holy Spirit. Now, I want to introduce to you, if I may, something that, that I'm kind of excited about, and I'll tell you why ahead of time. And that is, there are there is this growth. Now, this is matter for next week's sermon, but I've got to put this in today. I'm going to mention it in probably more detail next week. There is a movement in some of the more progressive Christian churches um, and progressive amongst progressive preachers. There is a movement to denigrate the Old Testament, to say it is of little or even almost no value. Perhaps that you've heard the phrase, we need to unhitch the New Testament from the Old Testament. Have you heard that expression? There's a, a preacher in Georgia, in Atlanta, who's famous for using that expression, unhitch the Old Testament. We have to learn to unhitch it, to literally pay almost no attention to the Old Testament and focus on the New and so forth. Um, as I say, I'm going to say a great deal more about that later. But as I was studying this passage, it came, there's something that came to me here that I'm going to share with you now that while it may not be original with me, it may be something I read in a book 30 years ago and forgot that I read it. By the way, the great Charles Spurgeon, i got to tell you this story. Again, I'm chasing a rabbit, but please let me do it for just a minute. But the great Charles Spurgeon, perhaps as original as any preacher ever was with the matter that he brought forth in his Sunday sermons, two a Sunday and one on Wednesday night and many other times during the week, the guy was an astounding, arguably the greatest pulpiteer that ever lived, arguably. I'm not going to get in an argument with you about it, but there are people who believe that. And, I mean, the right people, the people who are in the right believe that. No, I, I, I didn't say that, did I? Sorry, sorry. Anyway, but Spurgeon also was the founder of something called Spurgeon's College, and he was training young men for the ministry. And one of the tasks that they had set for them year after year was, on a regular basis, they would prepare a message and preach it in front of the student body with Mr. Spurgeon sitting in the back, and then he would offer a critique after, can you imagine trying to preach a sermon as a student in front of Charles Spurgeon, knowing that when you're done, he's going to critique what you have to say, and he's going to do it in front of everybody. So anyway, there was a young man, got up and preached, and, and, um, and then when he sat down, Spurgeon said, well, the first problem is you've preached one of my sermons. He, you, you know, it was something he had already preached, and, uh, and he... Um, and so at that point, the whole thing kind of fell apart. The guy was under discipline and various things. But in private, as they interviewed him and tried to figure out what was going on, he absolutely insisted that he had not plagiarized one of Spurgeon's sermons. And, um, and, and Spurgeon finally pulled a book off the shelf, a published book, and opened it to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the page and said, read this. Is this not my sermon published under my name? Is this not the sermon you just preached? And the young man read for a few minutes, and he said, I have to agree, this is the sermon that, you, that, that I just preached, and, um, and I see now why you think I plagiarized your sermon, so I'll admit it is plagiarism, but I didn't copy it from you. What? And it turns out that there was an old Puritan preacher from 200 years before Spurgeon who had preached that same sermon. It was something that Spurgeon had read as, as a boy, and incorporated the things in it so thoroughly into his mind that years later he preached it as though it was his own and didn't even remember that he had copied it himself from somebody else. So, long story short, 30 years ago I may have read something like this, but I don't remember where or when. I'm not claiming originality, but I am claiming that this is something I have not read or heard lately, 
and I think it could be very helpful, especially when we're faced with things like men saying, we've got to unhitch the Old Testament from the New, pay attention to the New, most especially just pay attention to the red letters, forget the rest of the Bible, on and on it goes. So what I want to talk to you now is, a, is called Three Logical Steps to Embracing the Bible. Maybe I should have called it Three Logical Steps to Embracing the Whole Bible. So here's how we're going to do this. Three steps. Number one, Peter, James, and John heard the Father say, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Or listen to him. Now let's just pause for a moment and think about the ramifications of that statement. Peter is claiming Decades later, after Jesus has long died on the cross, been buried in the tomb, risen from the dead, ascended to glory, sent the Holy Spirit, this is decades after all those events. Peter is an old man. He's getting ready to die. He's probably in Rome when he writes this because there's every reason to believe that he was crucified upside down in Rome and so forth. A lot of reasons to believe that. Uh, not proven, but reasons to believe. So that being said, we need to ask ourselves, when Peter is so standing for the concept that Jesus is the Son of God, and when he speaks, he speaks with the voice of God, and he is contending for that truth to the point that he's willing to die for his faith, are we going to stand up and say, I think Peter was mistaken? Or worse, I think Peter is telling a lie. <laughs> no, you're not going to say that. The man is dying for what he believes. So whether it's right or wrong, he believes it to be true. That he heard, and he quote, you know, he mentions the fact that, that, or we mention the fact, we know the fact that there were two others with him. All three of them heard the majestic voice from heaven. All three of them heard that God says, this is Jesus, my beloved son, you listen to him. Okay, so I'm going to assume that, that neither logically nor historically would any of us dare say that Peter told a, an untruth in this situation. Therefore, that command, listen to Jesus, passes down to each of us, to all of us. It passes down to the world. If you want to know what the Creator has to say and wants you to know about Him and about your relationship with Him, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Okay? Jesus said, uh, I'm now going to Luke 24, verse 44, but Jesus said, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, you understand that when Jesus divides the New Testament into those three parts, he's using a Jewish terminology for the whole Bible, the entire Old Testament. The law, the prophets, and the writings, or the Psalms. He's, he's, he's mentioning the entire Old Testament and affirming it. He says, everything written about me in the Old Testament must be fulfilled. There's no option. These things will be fulfilled. Therefore, we dare not, if we're listening to Jesus, we dare not unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. We may wrestle with some of the language, we may wrestle with an understanding of the history, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but we must not unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Quite frankly, to unhitch the new from the old, it would be exactly the same as removing the foundation from your house. Now, if you could just, by some magic ability, take some sharp knife or something and cut the foundation out from under your house, what would happen to the rest of the house? It would soon collapse, and you know that. All right, so that's the second step. The Father says, listen to Jesus. Jesus says, the Old Testament is God's word. It is true prophecy. It must be fulfilled. And then, after the fact... I'm sorry, he says that after the fact. He says that about the Old Testament because the Old Testament was completed. It was written in his lifetime. But now, Jesus also speaks of the trustworthiness of the soon-to-be-written New Testament. So let's go to the next slide, and I want to read to you from John chapter 16. Notice what Jesus says to the disciples as he talks to them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And starting in John 16, verse 12, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now look at verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, when Jesus said these things, the New Testament wasn't written. As far as I know, not a single word of it had been written down. 
And Jesus is yet affirming that when the Holy Spirit comes, and we can read about that in Acts 2, the day of Pentecost, fills the disciples and so forth. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will then select out certain men, fill them with his Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit, fill them with himself in such a way that as they write the record of Jesus' life, as they write the book of Acts, the historical part, as they write the epistles, they are preserved from committing error. They are still writing in their own personalities so that Matthew doesn't sound like Mark, Mark doesn't sound like Luke, John is very different from the other three, um, Paul's epistles don't sound like John's or Peter's and so forth. They write with their own personalities intact and yet are preserved in such a way that everything they write is as perfect as the Old Testament. Therefore, Jesus is affirming the New Testament before the fact. So, in his lifetime, Jesus affirms the Old Testament after the fact of it being written. He affirms the New Testament as the Word of God before the fact of it being written. So Jesus is declaring that the New Testament will turn out to be just as much the Word of God as the Old Testament already was. Now, that should not provide any difficulty for you or for me because this is how God always talks. He knows the end from the beginning. If you look back and you read about the characteristics of God and, and the nature of God as he describes himself, particularly, say, in the chapters in Isaiah from chapter 40 on to the end of the book, but especially chapter 40 through about chapter 50, where God talks about his ability to both know the future before it occurs and to determine the future. So it will occur as he knew it to be. All those things are declared in the Old Testament. And so when Jesus says, you're going to write the New Testament, it's going to be just as much the word of God as the Old Testament. He's just talking the way God always talks. Now, just to underline some of these things, there's the three steps right there. God says, listen to my son. Jesus says the Old Testament is the Word of God. Jesus says the New Testament will also be the Word of God, therefore we can count on the Word of God. But what else did Jesus say? Matthew 5, 18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, Jesus' words, will not pass away. In other words, there are no left out words from Jesus. Whatever he said that was to be determined to be eternal, not everything he said to his mom when she asked him, is it raining outside or whatever, not, not that kind of thing, but all the things that, that he said that were for eternity, all that God has intended for us to know has been recorded in this book for all time. Please get our heads around, let's get our heads around this with God's help. Everything he wants us to know is recorded in this book for all time. There's no later revelation. It's this book and that's all we need. So what was the result of all this? I hope you hear this with your heart. After spending three years with Jesus, the apostles believed the whole Bible was the infallible, inerrant, divinely inspired, authoritative word of God. And so should you and I. I don't want to believe less than Peter. Do you? I hope not. Actually, it's so much the word of God that I think I can say this, even though you, you see the humor involved. If you want to hear God speak, just open your Bible and read it out loud. <laughs> what you hear will be God speaking. So remember, this is Peter's great word. Recall, let me remind you, you need to remember. Remember, the Bible alone is God's full revelation of himself and his work. Thus, the Bible alone is the foundation of a reality-based worldview. Anything other than a, a worldview based upon God's word is fantasy from the outset. Secondly, the Bible alone can credibly make the claim to be the record of God's self-revelation to humankind. Only the Bible explains history, that is, its purpose and its end. In fact, the Bible could be described as God's memory of what matters in history or God's outline of the high points in world history. In fact, I would go so far as to say this, that we have a lot of people studying history, both what's sometimes called modern history and ancient history and even prehistoric history. We call that archaeology sometimes. Uh, and, and, and you follow where I'm going with this, but the fact is we need to develop the habit of learning to fit every genuine discovery. And I'm not saying that a lot of it's false or fake because most of it, especially if it appears in the right kinds of journals and news, news uh, media and so forth, is true. The, the discoveries are real. But we need to learn to, to put them into God's outline of history 
and not um, and not not man's. Actually, I, I've been fascinated lately by a man named Irving Finkel. He saw me last night while I was listening to one not long before we, we went to bed. One of his podcasts, Irving Finkel. He's a curator at the British Museum, and she said. <laughs> Why are you listening to Santa Claus? Because he's got a white beard down to here, long hair and all that, but he is a scholar in cuneiform and other ancient languages, second literally to no one in the world. And he was talking about a recent discovery that helped them to understand. Now, they've had, I guess, for 150 years, they've had this clay tablet that they understood was a Babylonian version of a map of the world, but they didn't know how to read it, and they recently found a little bit of cuneiform on a broken shard of clay that helped them to finally begin to really understand uh, what the Babylonian view of the, uh, of the world, of the map of the world, and what they mean. And one part of it points directly to Mount Ararat. Finkel, I don't know if Finkel's a Christian, I have no idea, kind of doubt it, but he said, you got to understand that for the Babylonians, the idea that they could go to Mount Ararat and, as is recorded here, continue even in that day, which was, he thinks, written some 500 years before the birth of Christ, even in that day they could go to Mount Ararat and still see the ribs of Noah's Ark on the mountain. And, and he said, for them, it was as real as any fact that you or I know today. I'm saying let's let Irving Finkel, to that extent and no more than that for the moment, let's let him guide us in learning how to put all the discoveries about ancient history into God's outline of the history of the world that goes from the creation of Adam to, of course, the time of, of uh, Christ and shortly thereafter. So only the Bible explains history. Only the Bible explains true righteousness as God understands it. Only the Bible explains sin and how sinful man can be reconciled to God. Only the Bible describes man's potential through the new birth and salvation. That's what Peter's been dealing with in the first part of the first chapter of 2 Peter. And the Bible demonstrates how God's word alone provides the necessary ingredients for any nation to be blessed. Uh, Vishal Mangalwadi is a, an Indian Christian scholar, philosopher and scholar. He's written a book called The Book That Made Your World. As a man from India, he examines the impact of the Bible on Europe, the impact of the Bible particularly upon England and the British Empire because of its influence in, in India, his, own, his home country. Vishal Mangalwadi has written a 480-page book or something in which he plainly points out that every nation that has put the Bible as the foundation for its law, the foundation for its education, the foundation for its culture, the foundation for everything that makes life meaningful and true, Wherever you find a country who even for a little while did that, you'll find a far superior lifestyle in that country. Greater freedom, greater success in human endeavors, greater, it's always a blessing for the Bible. And so I'm saying to you that the Bible demonstrates how God's word alone provides the necessary ingredients for any nation to actually truly be blessed. And by the way, Vishal Mangalwadi will be the keynote speaker at this year's uh, leadership prayer breakfast used to be called the mayor's prayer, bre prayer breakfast. He'll be speaking at the mayor's prayer breakfast this year, October 17, here in Calgary. And what a, an amazing event that will be just simply because he's there. He's one of, one of the special men of our time. Now, I started by telling you that the Bible is God's greatest aid to memory, and that's what Peter has in mind as he talks about, I need to remind you of what you need to keep uppermost in your minds. I want you never to forget it. So let's talk about how to, make a, how to make Scripture a memory aid, and with that, oh, goodness gracious, too many rabbits, done chased. I'm going to go really quickly. Think about it. If it were the wintertime, we'd still just be getting started with worship, right? So hopefully we're okay. Real quick. So how to make Scripture a memory aid. First of all, it is there to be read, so just read it, then read it again for the rest of your life. Never stop. Make systematic reading of the Bible your life practice. Now, what do I mean by systematic? Well, I mean read it every day, if possible. Read through entire passages. You see, reading a few verses is better than reading one verse. Reading chapters is better than reading a few verses. Reading whole books is better than chapters, and reading the whole Bible through again and again is best of all. Now, some people might argue that you've got to read it in the right spirit. But I say, while the right spirit or the right attitude toward your Bible reading is helpful, it isn't necessary. So what do you mean by that, preacher? Listen carefully. The Bible is God's omnipotent word. If you read it, 
It can break through no matter how hard your heart may be, no matter how blind your eyes may be. If you read it, it can break through. It is God's omnipotent word. Number two, trust that any standard or widely accepted translation is telling you God's truth in English or in any other language. Now, here's another thing. And I don't want you to hear me say more than I'm saying. I do think that it's wonderful to know the original languages of the Bible. To be able to read Greek and understand it or Hebrew and both or both and understand them will vastly increase your, your underlying knowledge of God's word. But you don't have to have it to understand it as God's word for you. Because you see, all honest translations of the Bible, and there are some dishonest ones. I'll say more about that next week. All honest translations of the scriptures are the word of God. I love what the King James translators say in their preface to the King James Version of the Bible about the idea. That, see, there was a lot of controversy. The King James Version of the Bible is replacing a couple of well-beloved English translations that have been well-established for over 100 years in each case. And, and now here comes this Johnny-come-lately, the King James Version of the Bible. And there was a lot of skepticism about it. So the, the translators developed this preface, which I wish were printed in every, every edition of the King James. It's not, and that's sad. But listen to what they say and, and let it speak to you. You'll see it on the screen behind me. We do not deny, we translators do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the worst translation of the Bible in English contains the Word of God. No, no, it is the Word of God. When the king gives a speech in Parliament, it is often translated into French, Dutch, Italian, and Latin. Yet it is still the king's speech though not all the translators have equal skill or grace in communicating his message. You can just see diplomatic couriers taking the copies of the king's speech, translated into those languages, then taking them to the capitals of Europe, and the various kings in these other nations would read and understand that they were reading a message from, well, in that case, King James. <laughs> but uh, but you, feel, you, you see what I'm saying, that some of those translations would be better than others, and yet they're all the king's speech. There are some translations to avoid. I'm going to skip that part, and we'll, I was going to say more about it next week, so I won't say anything this week. Number three, believe that the Bible speaks with clarity. This is so important. If you have an honest motive for reading the Bible, and especially if you are prepared to let God's Word speak to you, then whatever you think the Bible is saying is almost certainly what it is saying. Don't let somebody you know, come around and buffalo you with, well, you got to understand the Greek says, and blah, 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 blah. Listen, better Greek scholars than you've ever met have spent lifetimes preparing these translations, the standard ones that we read from. And you're not going to get better than that. You're just not. Uh, if you think that's what it's saying, it almost certainly is. Don't be fooled by modern interpreters who claim to prove that the Bible is full of errors or that the Bible means the opposite of what it appears to mean. And, and you, I'm, I'm shocked. I, I, I shouldn't be. It's been going on all my life. But I'm, I still remain shockable when it comes to cer certain scholars who have an axe to grind who will take a passage of Scripture that is so clear and plain in English or Spanish or whatever translation you're reading it in. And it's just clear as anything. And then they say, no, it means exactly the opposite of that right. No, don't be fooled by critics of the Bible in general. Almost all objections to the Word of God are quite old. They go back, some, in some cases, thousands of years, and most of all those issues and objections were well answered a long time ago. Now, number four, and this, I think, is, is quite important. Read the Bible as the Bible. In other words, read the Bible as the Bible, not just as the book of Mark, or not just as the book of Acts, or not just as the book of Romans. Read the Bible as the Bible. As a general rule for your spiritual growth, you should not let someone else assume the task of showing you what passages in the Bible you should read. Now, all of us have in our homes, I'm sure, a number of devotional books. Jeannie and I have two that we read from daily, one in the morning and one at night. So I'm not against devotional books. I'm not against things like a Bible promise book. I'm not against, you know, any of these books that have lists of verses, all the promises of the Bible, all the prayers of the Bible, the Bible on healing, the Bible on family, the Bible on sexuality or social justice or anything else. I'm not opposed to people putting together books like that, even though every word in these kinds of works is from God's word, the approach of singling out verses on a single subject, in my view, will never have the same impact on your life as you get from systematically reading the Bible through. 
and thereby always reading God's Word in context. You see, the beauty of the Bible, and I hope you'll hear this and never forget it, the beauty of the Bible is its ability to speak to a dozen topics in as many verses and do it without losing coherence. In the Bible, all of life is blended together in such a way that it can speak directly to the needs and the situation of every person on the planet, and it does so best when you are reading systematically. But you say, and I hear people talk like this, what if I'm in Kings or in Ezekiel, and what I need for that day is in some other book of the Bible? My experience has been that if your regular reading has you in Kings or Ezekiel or one of the minor prophets or the book of Leviticus, I started to say, God forbid, but no, no, (laughs) no. you got to read the book of Leviticus. Otherwise, you'll never know where Jesus came up with the idea that you got to love your neighbor as yourself, right in the book of Leviticus, many other things besides. Anyway, listen, if you're already reading regularly, steadily through the Bible, and you get to that point, and there's some pressing need in something on your heart, something in your life, and you're saying, God, I need help here, then you must assume that in the providence of God, what you need will likely be found in the place where you've already been reading. You don't, here the problem is, you don't know what you need, but God always does. So trust him to be able to speak to you from every part of his word. Two questions to avoid error. See, we don't need to approach the scriptures as though they can magically transmit a word to us directly from God. Instead, we need to learn to follow what I'm calling a two-step process or a two-question approach. So begin, when you're reading a passage, ask yourself, apart from me personally or, or my own needs, what does this passage say? And so you need to seek to understand what the passage is saying to people in general, to nations, the nation in the story, perhaps to Israel or, or something of that sort, or in general, what is the Bible in this passage saying to the world? And once you believe that you have some kind of a handle on that, then you ask, and and by ask I mean you pray, and you say, God, help me to properly apply this passage to my life, and I promise you, he will. He will. Now, one example quickly, and just to show you how easy this can be, in Genesis chapter 50, you'll remember what Joseph said to his brothers who had kidnapped him and sold him into slavery decades earlier. And what did Joseph say? You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. And Joseph wasn't just thinking about him and his brothers, he was, and his father and you know, the rest of the family. He was thinking about all of Egypt, all the Egyptians. God preserved entire nations because he put Joseph in a particularly strategic point, uh, place in Egypt at a certain time. And it all began with him being sold into slavery into Egypt. So in this case, the process is easy. First, you understand why Joseph would say that. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And then you observe how, in saying this, he revealed to his brothers that he understood that in his life, God had always been at work in both the good fortune and the bad. Can can we learn to say that? In my life, whether I'm struggling or whether I'm sailing, in either case, God is at work in my life And God always means whatever is happening to me, God always means it for my good. Now, Joseph had had personalized this, this truth, and he could say it to his brothers in all sincerity. So then we need to learn to say to ourselves, many evils have been done to me, so God help me to believe that you are at work, and that all that's happened is for my good, but also for the world's good. Help me to forgive those who've done me evil. So just as Moses could forgive his brothers, we are able to forgive those who've done evil to us. Remember this, and with this I actually close. Peter could never forget what he saw and heard on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Hear him. I guarantee that if you become a regular Bible reader, God will create equally memorable mountaintop moments in your life. You may be sitting in a recliner in your den or riding the train to work, but by faithfully reading through God's word, there will be times when the passage before you will come to you with such force that you will know in your heart that you have met with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Would you bow your heads, please? Oh God, 
Teach us to love your word. Teach us to read your word. Teach us to apply your word. And always, Father, for the purpose of the world seeing you in us and that our lives will then always point those people back to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we bow our heads then for the benediction? And I'm taking this from the end of 2 Peter, chapter 3, starting in verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, that is, the coming of Christ and so forth, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.